So I was um, very, very grateful when Chris and Andrew got in touch with me and um, invited me to be part of this conversation that you're having over the next month or so. I think it's so crucially important um, to be asking questions about who we are and how we are in relation to others, all sorts of others, at a time when those questions are posed very starkly in, in our society. And um, what I'd like to do this evening is um, consider this question, host and guest in the mission of God. And what I'd like to do, first of all, is um, look at a New Testament episode involving hosts and guests, um, and then maybe give some sort of framework for thinking about that and for what's involved in it. And I told Andrew I've got an incredibly long PowerPoint series, so I don't intend to go through it all. Um, but there are things there that we can jump to if that's where the conversation takes us. But uh, if you'd allow me to, I'd like to begin with a prayer. God of grace, we thank you that you are the creator of all things, that you are the savior of the world, that you are the source of life. And as we sit in this city, we look to you with hope, with trust, and sometimes in confusion and in questioning. Thank you that tonight we have the opportunity to share together about one aspect of what it might mean to discern what you are doing and what you call your people to participate in as you work in our world and specifically in this place. Lead us, we pray. Give us ears attentive to you and to each other and to the others to whom you want us to relate with the love of Christ. Guide us so that this may be time well spent, invested in your kingdom and used by you in your wisdom to make us ever more effective and authentic in our walk with Jesus and in our participation in your kingdom, for the glory of your name. Amen. I'd like to do a little straw poll to begin with. Host or guest? Do you prefer hosting? Or do you prefer, I don't know if it's even a word, guesting. But let's make it a word for tonight, because it kind of matches. Hosting or guesting? And you've only got one vote, okay? Um, this is Oxford Terrace Baptist Church after all. Um, and I should have checked whether you're members or not, but let's uh, just leave that aside for the moment. Um, for these purposes, if you prefer to be, I mean, think of specific instances of you as the host and you as the guest, okay? Now, weighing it up, which is your preference? If you prefer to be the host, raise your hand. Thir 14. 15. We may have to bring in the appointed tellers, but 15, a rough estimate. If you prefer to be a guest, raise your hand. 11. 12. 12. 15 to 12. That's pretty close, isn't it? Um, so now we move. You know, this, this, is, this is rigorous research, okay? So we've done the quantitative study. Of those who declared a preference, 15 um, would prefer to be the host. 12 would prefer to be the guest. Now let's go to the qualitative analysis for the thick description. Some of you who prefer to be a host, what is it that makes being a host such a good thing, or at any rate, preferable to being the guest? As the host, you, yeah, so you avoid some of the awkwardness. Um, presumably, if you're the host, you can busy yourself with things. And you bring in the visitors, there they go, and then you say, oh, excuse me, I'm just getting things ready. 
and off you go. And so you're still doing the job, you know, um, fulfilling your obligations, but you don't have to go through the awkwardness of making small talk. Okay, thank you. Any other good points about being a host? Decide the menu. You get to decide what is going to be eaten. Yeah. Very important. Another thoughts? Okay. So that's positive hosting. <laughs> it depends from whose perspective. But from the perspective of the host, you know, you enjoy being a source of enjoyment for others. You, you get a bit of a reward from seeing people enjoy it, and if they don't enjoy it, you keep feeding them until they get the message that the only way to stop you feeding them is to look as if they're enjoying it. And then, of course, you offer them some more because uh, they're enjoying it. You. So we've got a range of reasons, and I know nobody's got only one reason, but those you've, you've mentioned, some are to do with let's put it bluntly, the benefit to the host, okay? Um, there are aspects of the interaction that you don't feel trapped into because it's your house you can move about. Um, there's things about food. If you're in somebody else's house, you might not like their food. If you're in your house, you can have more control over that in certain circumstances. And then there's the delight in the other and seeing people enjoy what you've provided, that's very affirming. But then this other question of, here's a value. If hospitality is a good thing for a society to have, then let's do it and let's practice this and let's build that um, as, as something that we can participate in. These are great reasons. How about being the guest? What makes being a guest a good thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when in our family... Oh, we're having people round. I immediately go to the three hours after they've left. And I'm thinking, yeah, there's quite a bit of work involved here. <laughs> Making the place respectable, cleaning up after them. So, yes, you avoid all of that if you're the guest. Yes? Thank you. So there are these relational social gains, as well as the personal validation and affirmation. Yeah, if somebody's invited you, that in itself makes you feel good. And is a step towards you feeling belonging and acceptance. Wonderful. Any other good points? Yes? Right. So you enjoy the interpersonal communication. When you're the host, that's limited because there's so much work involved. And this frees you to do those social things. Cool. So that's the mirror image of if being a host is a value, is something positive. You can't be a host if there are no guests. And when you're a guest, that also involves, in a sense, a giving of yourself in some way um, to the other. And hosting and guesting are these um, complementary values and qualities that are needed. And the interesting point there about as Christians, we like to be the host. When you think not so much your personal life and your personal home, but your church life, um, is that true? When churches say hospitality, we assume, well, we are going to be hospitable and we'll invite people in. And yeah, and, and all the things that we said about what, how, what makes it a good to be a host are valid when we as churches act as host. Um, there are ways of getting out of awkward conversations when it's in your church, in your place. Um, you get to choose the menu. You get to decide what happens. Um, you do get some delight if people seem to enjoy um, um, what you're doing, but if they don't seem to be enjoying it, just push more on them. <laughs> and who knows, they may come through. Um, but that's an interesting reflection, that if we want to be the host, then what is it with us as churches that makes us behave even differently than some of us do as individuals? and assume that our role is the hosting role. Suggest maybe there's power involved, there's security. It can seem safer to invite people into our space than to accept an invitation into somebody else's space. 
and I've certainly experienced that in my church life. And um, a couple of examples that are pertinent to um, what you're experiencing here in, in Christchurch, and I'll give a few examples from um, Mangari Baptist Church, which um, my wife and I have had long association with and was our home church until a couple of years ago when we moved um, out of town. But I think we're still in the members' role, so I'm allowed to talk about it in the first person plural at the moment. Um, and one was in relation to the local Marae, um, Papatuanuku Kokiri Marae um, in Mangari, which is just, I mean, what would you say, Alicia, 200 meters from the church? Very close. But some years ago, um, you know, basically we, we made the observation that the church had been there for over half a century and had had no relationship with local Marae. Um, and I talked with a, a pastor who'd been pastor during what were considered the glory days of the church some decades ago when they had a big congregation and lots of things going on and asked him, so which were the Marai that you were connected with? And he said, well, we weren't. To be honest, he said, that really wasn't on our radar as Baptist churches at that time. Um, you know, we were a suburban church. The idea was if you're a half-decent preacher, you're on a lively service, the church will fill up with people. And that had been his experience. Um, but in the circumstances we were in, we were more alerted to the fact that, um, you know, in Mangri there are 11 Marae and very significant centers of, of community life. And here we were almost within shouting distance of one. So um, the first suggestion, um, um, I know this is, being recorded, so I'm kind of trying to be very cautious about what I say, um, and maybe it'll all be edited down to just the opening welcome and the farewell at the end. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to trust your judgment on, on that, um, on the editing desk. Um, but I want to talk openly because I'm only here for an evening, and we want to get down to business, really, in terms of how do we live well as a people who call ourselves followers of Jesus in a community, in a society that is facing all sorts of issues of fragmentation and tension and so on. And so a, a natural instinct was, well, we should invite the people from the Marae along to the church. You know, be the hosts, show hospitality, and make it Maori friendly so that it's easy for people to come, you know, and do all that. And then, well, it turned it all around. You know, what if we were to receive a, a, an invitation onto the Marae? Um, how would that change things? And well, that's what happened. Um, our pastor, by a believed divine appointment, got in touch, um, came into contact with the Kaifaka Hairi, the, the sort of manager of the Marai. Um, and we were invited as a church, you know, come along. He said, look, we've, we're the church down the road. Um, I don't think that our church has ever been received onto the Marai. Um, would that be a possibility? And she said, of course it would. And so fixed a day, a Sunday, we didn't have a service in the church, um, but the congregation went along to the Marae. We were received on with a pothery, um, with whakawhanonga uh, tanga, the process of creating, weaving relationships and making connections. And that began a relationship that has been utterly transformative for that church and also for the Marae and for people on the Marae. And it's got to the point now, about three years on, where there is a real interweaving. And there are many folk who are an overlap now of Church in Marae. And when Andrew was uh, studying at um, Cary, one of his ministry placements was in that church. And he spent a lot of his time on, on the Marae. And when Alicia um, joined him, she also built strong relationships, friendships there. That, I mean, really, that's determinative of the character of the church now, wouldn't you say? And it's very hard to imagine that church without this deep relational connection with Tangata Fenua um, in that place. But it started with being guests. The initial instinct, be the hosts. 
And then we control it, and then we feel safe because we're in our space. No, let's be the guests when we feel vulnerable and awkward because we're not sure what to do or how we'll be received. But out of that guesting, missional guesting, came the relationship. Another one in process. Some months ago, similarly, there's, there's now a, a Muslim quarter in Mangri near the airport, a part of town where... There are, um, there's a big mosque, there are three Muslim schools, um, many Muslim families um, living in that, that area. Um, and again, in the church, the question was, who are those among the churches who are friends of this Muslim community? And um, we had some connections, and one or two folk were invited along. But then an opportunity came for folk from the church to be invited to the mosque. And so some went. Wait, did you go that time, Alicia? Yeah. And what, what happened? So Alicia explained that um, when the group from church went, um, it was split into the men and the women, appropriate for the, the, the context there. And so among the women... That was simply the sharing of friendship, and, and on a deep level, eh, talking about prayer, talking about faith. And one of the women who went told me that um, afterwards, you know, the Muslim women and the Christian women were exchanging phone numbers, and some of the women, Muslim women say, no, so you pray as well. Well, can, can we get in touch when there are things that we want you to pray for? And there was this sense of a connectedness that was something that was very beautiful. And then... I mean, that was well before the mosque attacks. But after the attacks, that pre, that preparatory relating, uh, you know, proved very important. And since the attacks, there has been an occasion at the church where the imam and two of the other members of the mosque community um, were invited along to the church service and given free reign to speak just to talk about the experience of being migrants and being Muslim in New Zealand and given the opportunity to talk about their faith. And the pastor, you know, he has confidence in that church community. So he's not thinking, oh, I might say something that's, that's not very Christian, you know, <laughs> but how do we shut the guy down? Quite the contrary. I mean, he apparently, um, he kind of really went for it and he, you know, with great enthusiasm, um, talked about his, his faith and its so on. But afterwards, um, he went up and hugged the pastor um, and said, Brother, we are friends for life. I never thought that I'd be able, as a Muslim imam, to go into a church and talk in the way that I've talked. So that's both a host, a guesting and a hosting that produces or contributes to an ongoing relationship within which faith can be shared at a deep level and support can be shared um, in the things that people face in their lives. Cool, thank you for that. And that's a good way in to the biblical passage I'd like to look at, um, which takes us into the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 10, and the alert New Testament scholars among you will know that this is the incident, the episode involving Cornelius, the Gentile military officer, and Peter, the apostle. And the rather strange and awkward story of how they got together and what came out of that. Good, and, and here's the beginning of the text that we'll read. At Caesarea, I, I know it's a fairly long reading. Um, I hope you don't mind that. But what I'd invite you to do is to look for examples of being a guest and of being a host and how the guesting and the hosting are both participation in what God is doing. So at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. 
He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now here's a thought. Oh, there's a thought. Mission doesn't start with us. We haven't got to the bit involving Peter yet, but God's already at work. And God is at work in people beyond the imagination of those who think of themselves as the missionaries. God is dealing with people, and people are looking for God before we get there. And before Peter got on the scene, there was a man and a family, a household, yearning for God. And God was at work. So, let's continue. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. A comment there. He um he was a guest. He was a guest in the house of a guy who ran a tanning business from home. And quite smelly, you know, taking the skins off animals and um, curing them, treating them. And in those days, you you didn't have a big mansion. You know, you had a little house, probably one room downstairs, maybe a curtained off area for the um head of the family um, to to sleep. Um, But guests would probably sleep on the floor um, in the workshop, which was also the family home. So imagine the smells, imagine the sound, imagine the busyness, customers coming and going. Um, And that's where Peter is. He said he was lodging there. So I don't know. It might have been the cheapest Airbnb in town in Joppa. It doesn't sound as if it was very salubrious, but he was there, a guest in in the house. And it says that um, he became hungry. You know, that sometimes happens when you're a guest. Has anybody had that experience? (laughs) Sometimes there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about mealtimes. I remember as a student being sent to York. It was from London. It wasn't like from New Zealand, but (laughs) sent to York. Um, on a student placement, and I misread the culture. Um, This was a household where tea, your evening meal, took place at 5 p.m. And after that, you're totally out of luck. And so I think they'd invited me to arrive at about 6. Which sounds like a Scottish thing, (laughs) but... Um, but there were Yorkshire people. They often say, take the skin off a Yorkshireman, you'll find a Scotsman underneath. <laughs> Never been tested empirically, but I'm inclined to believe it. But um, anyway, I arrived at this household at about six o'clock, absolutely starving. Because I thought, it's really rude if you arrive and they've prepared a big meal to welcome the student pastor for the summer. And I'm too hung- you know, I can't eat it because I had fish and chips in the way. Um, so I'm good to take care that I arrive and I'm able to have a meal with them and get off to a good start with this family. So we sat and we talked and we talked and we talked. No food. No food. Eventually, about maybe half past six, seven o'clock, um, the hostess said, uh, Ah, would you like a cup of tea? And I thought, it's, it's, it's something. You know, maybe it's a start. 
So I said, oh, yes, yes, please, yes, please. And they brought out a cup of tea. A cup, you know, nothing else, no plate, <laughs> just a cup of tea. And then um, I must have, the husband must have got a little bit sort of um, anxious about this young guy who um, might still be hungry and said, oh, would you like anything to eat? And I swallowed my pride and I said, well, actually, yes, please. That would be really nice. And so he went through to the kitchen and he came back with two rich tea biscuits. <laughs> that was it. Um, I later found that the wife was a bit worried about the husband putting on weight, and so she was limiting his calorific intake. <laughs> Things were hard that summer. <laughs> but, but it was just hard. And I was the guest. You know, I couldn't just walk into the kitchen and say, you know, hey, I'll come and check out your fridge you don't mind, I'll see what you've got, anything left over from dinner. I'm the guest. You've got to wait for the host to decide what you will eat and when. And I just wonder if Peter's in that situation. Eh? You know, he's, a, he's an active guy, he gets a bit hungry, but he's not at home. He can't just go down to the, you know, to the cupboard and say, have we still got any bread? Um, hey, let's rustle up something to eat. I need a bit of a feed. Instead, he has to, to wait. And what do you do as a guest when you're not in control and you just have to be there? Well, Peter went to pray. And um, it's never a bad idea. But where did he go to pray? Well, in those busy environment, you know, so much going on, the workshop, the street, everything else, the only, the only quiet place is up on the roof. And of course, we're not thinking, you know, a sort of um, a roof like on our houses. We're thinking a flat roof. Um, and up he goes and, and he, he prays. But as a guest, his prayer actually takes a different form. This is interesting. The very physical environment where he is finds its way into what happened when he prayed. I'll read it. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being led down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And a voice said, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, on those flat roofs, the sun beat down very heavily. And so they often had a kind of a tarpaulin, you know, like a sail device. Um, some people have that in other parts of New Zealand where there is sunshine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I know you've had beautiful days in Christchurch as well. But <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but imagine Peter under this big sheet, this tarpaulin. And that's, he's falling asleep um, under this big sheet. And from downstairs, there are the smells of the tannery, of all these animals of all sorts of kinds who have been um, skinned and, and, and are being prepared, which is the work of, of Simon the tanner downstairs. So that combination of the of the sheet and the heat and the smells and the animals. And that's what his vision is about. All kinds of animals and the voice tells him, get up, kill and eat. And Peter's response? Well, of course it's the response of a, of a good Jew. Surely not, Lord. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. This voice, wherever it's coming from, this voice is telling me to break the rules that I've been brought up with. And it's putting me in a very difficult, awkward, uncomfortable situation. I'm being asked to kill unclean, impure animals and therefore become impure myself. And what is that going to do to my relationship with God who looks for a people who are pure and holy? The voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God 
has made clean. This happened three times. Paul's asleep. Sheep comes down. Animals, get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, no, I don't eat unpure. I don't eat unclean things. I don't eat impure things. Don't call anything impure that God has called clean. Paul's asleep. Sheep, animals, voice, response. God's reply. Paul's asleep. And you get the picture. It goes on and on. And it's like one of those recurring things where he's just a bit, falls asleep. Oh my goodness, here's that vision again. And always with this deep, uncomfortable challenge. So what's going on? Before we can reach the people God is dealing with, remember that's Cornelius and his household, our attitudes have to be changed. God's intention was that Peter would take the good news of Jesus to Cornelius and find himself involved in a new community of faith that was diverse ethnically and culturally. That was God's intention. But Peter could not be used by God for that purpose until his own heart and mind had been changed. His attitude toward the other. Because it wasn't just animals that Peter called impure or unclean. It was people. People who were not like him. People who were among the nations, the Gentiles, that did not have the privileges of his ethnic group and his religious history. They are unclean, they are impure, and therefore I will not associate with them. Certainly won't go into their homes, because that would make me impure. And I want to keep my purity in the eyes of God and in the eyes of my own people. And that's the perception that God was challenging. So this involved a journey, a physical journey, actually. All this happened because Peter made time and space to pray. So when we're talking about effective and authentic mission engagement in our context, that's the first journey. Because unless we are open to God changing our perception and attitudes towards the other, we will not be in a position to be used by God in reaching those whom God loves and many of whom God is already at work in. So, let's read on. When Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, now Luke is the author of the book of Acts, I think he's laboring a point here. He wants us to know that three Gentiles turning up at the house is linked very closely to the vision that Peter has just seen. So while Peter is still wondering about the vision, the men arrived. And then, while Peter is still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, it took a direct command, a direct prompting by the Spirit to push Peter into acting on what he was beginning to wonder might be God's attitude to the Gentiles. The Spirit said, um, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down, said to them, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who's respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guests. So Peter's become a host. That's a big move hosting Gentiles. Admittedly, it wasn't actually his house. 
So we're not told what Simon the Tanner thought about this, if he had any issue with Gentiles being invited in to stay. It's another problem of being a host. Sometimes you invite one guest and then they bring their friends. And uh, poor Simon the Tanner, he'd already got one hungry guest who couldn't wait for dinner, and now three more arrive, and they've been walking for two days, so they must be pretty hungry as well. And then I wonder if in the household they're getting together and saying, these folk are Gentiles. What do Gentiles eat? Well, we've got a few animals, <laughs> but... <laughs> mm. So all sort of consternation going on at the hosting end. But Peter makes this enormous step to invite them in, and something is happening. When God starts to change our attitudes, we need to turn them into action. You can't just hang about and say, hey, I've come to a wonderful new realization. I look forward to talking with my Christian friends about my new attitude to the ungodly world. It's, that's not how it works. If God begins to open our eyes, time and again, that will be shortly followed by an opportunity to act on what we are now beginning to see, even if we haven't fully grasped it, because the acting on it is part of the grasping it. And that's what happened with Peter. While he's still wondering what it meant, while he's still thinking about this vision, unclean animals, God says they're not unclean. What could this mean? He says, look, Peter, there are three, three men looking for you. Who are they? Oh, they're unclean people. They're impure people. They're Gentiles. Oh, well, we can't have anything to do with... Oh, hang on. Unclean animals. God says they're not impure. Unclean people. I wonder if there's a link. And so Paul, and then the prompting of the Spirit, you better go down to the door, Peter, they're looking for you. And so he says, uh, well, you better come in. Have some of you experienced, are some of you even now experiencing that sort of visceral angst that involves with taking the step of inviting somebody into your home that you're not too sure about? And you're wondering how you're going to get on with them and whether it's going to be okay and is there going to be a problem? Well, that's what, uh, that's what Peter was doing. So here's the second journey. The first journey to prayer, in which he is challenged by God and his mind begins to open. The second journey to the stranger. I suspect that many of you have made both those journeys in your life of faith. And I believe strongly that in what is happening in our country and indeed our world at the moment, that more of us will be called more often to make these two journeys, the journey to prayer with an openness to have our minds changed about other people and other types of people, and the journey to the stranger to enact that which God is dealing with us about. Well, the story continues. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. No, outwardly, anyway. May I ask why you sent for me? This is intriguing. You know, I see there the awkwardness of intercultural engagement on both sides. There's Cornelius, and he's been told by God through an angel to send for this man, Peter. So he's pretty sure Peter is a messenger of God. And how do you receive a messenger from God? I'm going to be a host. 
I'm going to receive into my home a messenger from God. What do I do? How do I behave? I don't even know where to start. And meanwhile, the messenger from God is thinking, yesterday this seemed almost like a good idea to set off. And now, you know, I've had a a day and a half on the road to think about it and it's not feeling good, and I'm getting close to this house, and it's not only in a city that's largely pagan, it's in a house that is occupied by an officer of the Roman army. And they're not, you know, I've got a lot of issues with the Roman army and why they're even in our country. They're the occupying force, and here they are. Okay, you know, the local Jews say he's a decent guy, but even so, he's a Gentile. I've never been in a Gentile house in my life. I was warned about this when I was a kid. My mum said, Young Simon, there are certain places you must not go because they are unholy and impure, and it's a sin to go into them. Never go into the home of a Gentile. And that's how he'd been brought up. And he'd lived like that up to that point, very largely. Jesus did some embarrassing things with Gentiles. But Peter could overlook that because, you know, on balance, Jesus was a good guy. But when it came to him, he wasn't going to make himself impure by association with Gentiles. And now he's there, and he enters in, and he's awkward. And he's conscious of the group that he's coming into. He's also conscious of the people who've come with him. And they're watching him, and they're thinking, now, Peter, be careful. Don't go too far. You know, you might be able to talk to these people, but don't go into the house. Don't go into the house, Peter. Don't do it. And he finds himself drawn inexorably onwards. They're both feeling so awkward. And that awkwardness comes out in behavior and in speech. In Cornelius' side, it's behavior. You see what he does? He sees, oh, here he is. He's the man of God. He's God's prophet. Oh my goodness, he's coming into my home. What do I do? And suddenly he finds himself flat on the ground. And this wasn't kind of the Holy Spirit knocked him over. It was him feeling so awkward that he thought I've, he overdid the welcome. So he falls down to welcome Peter. Oh, great one. Oh, great one. And then Peter feels even worse. He says, this is just what these Gentiles are like. You know, they worship People instead of the one true God. And oh my goodness, this is awkward. So he says, get up, get up, man. I'm just a mortal. And then he goes into the house and suddenly it faces him. I'm, I'm, I'm in a Gentile house. What do I say? And so he starts by kind of excusing himself. You see, you're well aware, it's against our law for me, the Jew, to associate with um, uh, Gentiles like you. You know, people who are, you know, impure, no, not, not, not like us. And so it's against the law. I, I, I really shouldn't be here. You know, so don't think I'm a bad person just because I've come into your house. You know, I wouldn't normally do this, but God made me do it. So I'm here. So what's this all about? It's pretty awkward on both sides. But that, I mean, it happens in many relationships. Um, We could pause here and ask if anybody has any good first date stories of awkwardness, but let's not do that. It might be a distraction. Let me tell you about the first date between Mangari Baptist Church and Papatuanuku Kokiri Marai. We got there, and the the Kaifakahairi and the Marai had said to the pastor, "Um, do worship on our Marai. We'd welcome that. Um, Because it's all about the wairua, and, and we want that for our Marai. And so the pastor and I and uh, um, a Maori friend were together and we were saying, so how do you do that? Hey, how, do you, how do you do worship on the marae? Because it, it's not going to look like a normal Baptist church, is it? You know, so what happens? And so some of us had been on Noho Marae. So I suppose there'll be mattresses around the wall, you know, so you all sit there. And then um, it's not like somebody leads from the front. But, you know, um, it might be all sorts of people bobbing up and, Waiata and Karakia and this sort of thing. So we're all sort of trying to work out how to be Maori appropriate in doing our service. Anyway, we got there and after the hofuri and all of that, um, the cup of tea came back into the um, into the Fari Nui and the, the 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 building, and lo and behold, 
that were set out in rows of chairs. And there was a little table at the front with a white cloth on it, and a candle, and a statue of Jesus. And, um, and they were doing the same as the church. They were thinking, grief, we've got the Baptists coming. <laughs> How do you make Baptists feel at home? <laughs> Well, it's got to look like a church, <laughs> you know. That's, and some of them, of course, been to church, various churches. This is what happens in a church. They sit in rows and they look at the front and there's a little table with a cloth and, you know, there's Jesus is up there and there's a candle. And so let's set it all out for them and our guests will feel right at home. And so just like Cornelius is thinking, how do I welcome this man of God? Oh, I fall down before him. Oh, great fun. And so, no, no, that's not the way. And then Peter comes in and starts to talk and finds, this is really a, rather awkward. I don't, think I'm, uh, I don't think I'm hitting the right note with these people, really. But nonetheless, they were there. And in the, I mean, so many people and so many churches don't get to that awkward first date because they know it's going to be awkward. But you can't get to the long-term relationship without the awkward first meeting. And you just have to be willing to say, okay, this is going to be awkward, it might be embarrassing, we're going to feel silly, but God made me do it. So here we are. Um, Is an observation there. Outer journeys and inner journeys go together. The outer journey... Up the stairs to pray, down the stairs to welcome, up the road to um, the other town, into the house. They're all outer journeys, but they're matched by inner journeys in which his attitude is changing. And there's our third journey. Going to the people to whom God sends us. and accepting their invitation. So the missional hosting has been receiving in the three guys that Cornelius sent. Now we get the missional guesting, being prepared to accept the invitation into a place and into a community in which we feel awkward and don't quite know how to behave, but are there impelled by the Spirit of God as an act of obedience, and because God is doing something to shift our attitude from one of rejection and suspicion to one of recognition of their value in the eyes of God. It continues, Cornelius answered, three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer. And remember, your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. It was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So this is the guy that the evangelist is going to see. Seems he's pretty well on along the road. Hey. He's in relationship with God, the God of Israel. He's a man of prayer, of worship. He's living generously. He's known as someone who gives to the poor in accordance with what he believes about the God whom he worships. He's in touch with God. Spiritually, he's receiving messages from God. Maybe he doesn't so much need to be converted. Be converted means to be turned around. Going, maybe just needs to continue along that same trajectory towards the God whom he already knows but will come to know more fully in Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, the evangelist does need to be converted. He does need to turn around and have a change of mind and of heart and behavior. Um, mission is God bringing people who want to know him into contact with people whom he has prepared to be his messengers. Doesn't that give us great confidence in mission? It's not up to us to create the desire for God. It's there. 
It's not up to us to force people into the point where they say, okay, okay, I say yes to Jesus. How does it work in people? And there are many people who are longing for God more than the Christians are longing to reach them with the news of Jesus. It's my privilege in the role I have when I meet lots and lots of people who have become followers of Jesus and then want to study and learn and grow in their faith. I hear some great stories. A young woman called Grace. Grace is her English name. She's Chinese. And Grace had come to New Zealand as a teenager to study, but already she didn't know it was a desire for God but she longed to find some meaning in her life. And this was driving her almost to despair that she could see no reason for her existence. She could see nothing that would give fulfillment in her life. And she was a searcher. She read, she read philosophy, she asked questions, but she was in a context where she wasn't able to hear about Jesus. But something made her decide that if she came to New Zealand, she might have a chance of finding something about life and her meaning. And so she persuaded her parents to let her come to New Zealand to study. The reason she gave them was, if I go to New Zealand and study, I'll be able to get a really good job and I'll be able to buy you an apartment. And that was a compelling argument for her parents. And over she came. But she was wanting to find life and find purpose. It didn't happen. After six months, like so many young people who come to study in New Zealand, she had no friends. She found Kiwis very hard to get to know. Tended not to talk to foreigners in case they can't understand Kiwi English. And it's just awkward. So nobody was initiating friendship. And she was very shy. She stayed on her own in a student apartment. Study wasn't going well. Um, her life was not suddenly making sense to her. So it got to one point about six months in, and, and she told me she was in her room, and she was in despair. And um, happened to be a Sunday morning, and uh, she wasn't at uni. And so she said she prayed. She didn't know there was a God to pray to or what sort of God it might be, but she just said, Whoever or whatever you are, give me a sign. Give me something. Or I'm going to end my life today. Well, she said that, nothing happened. And so she's still pretty disconsolate. She thought, oh, I'll go down, down onto the street and maybe find something to eat. I don't know. So she got in the lift to go down. Bing, door opened a couple of floors down. Another Chinese girl got in that she hadn't seen before. This girl started chatting. It turned out they had the same dialect. They were from the same part of China. And so this girl said, oh, what were you going to do? Grace, oh, I was going to go and eat something. So the other girl said, well, I'm going to go get some food and take it back to my apartment. Um, why don't you come with me? We can, we can eat together. And Grace said, wow, this is nice. Um, but I still don't feel any better about the meaning of life, but at least I've got lunch. So, so down she went, they got some food, went back. She had a great time. She began to feel a bit better. And then as the day went on, um, through, the, through the Sunday afternoon, the other girl said to her, oh, look, it's Sunday. And um, I actually go to a church. It's a Christian thing. You know, it's the people in New Zealand, some of them go to church and they, they worship God. Um, like to come with me? And Grace said, sure. So she went with her, went along to a church which happened to be in West Auckland. And um, there, Grace heard the gospel explained pretty clearly for the first time in her life heard about Jesus, heard about the love of God in Jesus, heard about Jesus coming and dying and rising again and offering life to those who would follow him. And then 
preacher at the end said, uh, so does anybody here want to follow Jesus? And Grace, yes! <laughs> of course I do. This is what I asked for. This is my sign. I have been shown the way. And when I got to know her, she was part of the global congregation at the Auckland Baptist Tabernacle, which does a great work with international students. And um, she was actually doing um, Bible and theology training because she wanted to prepare to be a missionary. Um, there are people whom God is preparing and whom he wants to bring into connection with others whose hearts are open to people like Grace and can be that, that link. So you don't, you don't need me to spell out the challenge in that, do you? <laughs> be that person. You know, be the person who risks starting a conversation, who risks offering an invitation, who risks starting a friendship. And you don't know, but that could be something that God is arranging. That will be not the start of the story, but a continuation of the story that God has already begun in that person and in you as well. You better move along. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is. God doesn't show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Here's a thought on this one, which is a mission journey is a journey to get to know God better. Yes, other people get to know God, but the person on mission gets to know God better. See that little phrase at the start? I now realize how true it is. In fact, or the scholars among you, it's a present continuous um, uh, tense of, um, of, of the verb, katalambanomai. Um, so sometimes in English translations, it's just put as a, as, a, as a sort of fact. Well, I understand that God accepts everybody, which sounds a wee bit like Peter turning up and saying, okay, you're all Gentiles. So lots of people in my home environment think that you're beyond the pale. But of course, lucky for you, I'm the one who's here because I know better than them. I understand that God accepts. That's not what he's saying. It's as Peter hears the story of God's work in Cornelius and in his family, as Peter is in this place and sees around him all those people longing for God, that he says, ah, Catalambanomai, I'm getting it. That's the, the lambano sense of that word is to grab something and the kata puts an intensive on it. So now I'm, I'm grasping this truth. I'm getting it. God really is not prejudiced. God loves all people. And God is willing to accept all who look to him and trust in him and seek to do what is right. And that's what we, sorry. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So this is what this is the experience we have when we find ourselves caught up in this kind of mission. It's like, oh my goodness, now I'm really getting it. I've known theoretically, you know, that God accepts all sorts of people. Like Peter on the day of Pentecost, what did he say? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He knew his theology, but he didn't feel it in his heart. Because what he really meant, everybody like me who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody of my people, of my race, of my culture, of my religious background, everybody like us can be saved. But I don't know about them. I don't know. But now he goes and says, hang on, now I'm really getting it. It's not only everybody like me. It really is everybody who calls on the name of the Lord, no matter from what culture or background or situation of life. 
He learns something about God by the participation that God grants him in this act of mission. Invitation. There it is. Do you want to know God more? Put yourself in the risky, uncomfortable business of stepping out as a messenger of God. And you will learn more of him. And that's this point. Discomfort precedes discovery. I would say discomfort is the absolute prerequisite of discovery. You can't learn something new while you're comfortable. You can just get reaffirmed in what you think you already know. It's when you're uncomfortable that the opportunity for real learning comes. That's why for so many, and some of us here, the experience of migration brings new learning. Because it's uncomfortable. And everything is thrown up in the air. Whether you come from Scotland or China, there are new things to face, new challenges. Things don't work in the same way. What is going on? You're in the place of learning. And for Peter, discomfort preceded this wonderful discovery of God's love and acceptance of all kinds of of people. So it's an invitation to be uncomfortable in order to discover more of God. And mission makes Jesus known. That's what Peter talked about. He didn't go in to talk about his own generous spirit. Oh, you're Gentiles, but you know, I've changed. I used to be a bit down on the Gentiles, to be honest, especially the Romans, present company accepted. Some of them are a bit of a problem, but I'm a warm-hearted person, so I embrace you with my love. That's not what he talked about. He said, I find it so confusing to be here, frankly. All I can do is tell you about Jesus. And what he did went about doing good. A hospital chaplain I knew when I was a hospital chaplain senior guy said, let me give you my motto in life. I take it from Jesus. That simple verse, I went about, he went about doing good. And I thought, that is beautiful. What a motto. He said, of course, I'm not Jesus, so I only do half of that. I go about. <laughs> <laughs> At least I can do that bit. <laughs> we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. God raised him from the dead. Their day caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Now, were they hosts or were they guests? Ponder that one. But hosting and guesting is involved in Jesus eating and drinking with them and in the encounter that they have. Um, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify, he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And when Peter said, everyone, he was looking at a much bigger everyone than he thought of before. He was learning about the scope of God's grace and forgiveness. So they hear Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' lordship, Jesus' forgiveness. Peter may have been clumsy, he may have been awkward, he may have been uncomfortable, but there's no mistaking who he was talking about. And that's all that was needed. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who'd come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Peter still has some reluctance to overcome, both in himself and in the group of friends who were there. 
And, you know, we don't read that Peter said to them, okay, now you've come to believe in Jesus. It's important that you take the step of baptism because baptism represents repentance and baptism issues you in. He wasn't actually doing that. It was only when God kind of jumped the process um, because it's normally be baptized and you will receive the Holy Spirit. It was as if God couldn't wait for Peter to get to that bit. And God just poured out the Spirit. And then Peter is to say, hey, God's doing this. So we daren't get in the way. How can we refuse baptism? And baptism, of course, is not just this individual spiritual experience. Baptism is full incorporation into the community of believers. In other words, you are now our family. That's what's so radical. We're part of a new family that comprises Jew and Gentile in and because of Jesus Christ. And so they're baptized. And then, what happens after that realization? Well, fellowship can't remain in the abstract. It has to be concrete. It has to be real. And so they ask Peter to stay with them for a few days. So it might be bad enough just going into the Gentile home, you know, just stepping over the threshold, giving his message, and then retreating for a kind of kosher burger or whatever, you know, he kind of relaxed with. But if you're staying there for a few days, you're eating Gentile food, you're sleeping in a Gentile space alongside other Gentiles, you're sharing in the Gentile practices of the day, they become Peter's family Peter becomes their family. And there's the challenge. Are we ready, not only theoretically to accept different people as part of the same family of God, but practically and in reality to share life to the extent of hosting and guesting, of eating and drinking, of sharing the practices of life that matter to each other? What a challenge that is for the church in New Zealand. It's one thing to say, all are welcome. It's quite another thing to share life with people who are different culturally, ethnically, in terms of language. But that's the reality. And that's how the world sees that this gospel is something of power. And Paul wrote to the Romans. Remember his And the text that he started from, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Now, when I was growing up as a young person and learning Bible texts, I kind of stopped there. Because that seemed to be the important bit. Power of God for salvation, especially my salvation. That is so good to know. But that's just the start for Paul. It wasn't, he's the power of God for salvation. It's the power of God for salvation to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. That's the power of God. Saving into one family people who otherwise would be apart from each other. Socially, culturally, in whatever way we can think of. And that's what we need to express as a church in New Zealand. Especially at a time when there are voices that say, oh, diversity doesn't work. You know, we need to go back to being, not that there ever was a back to being, you know, but let's go back to being just all one type of person when life was so much simpler and we didn't have to deal with all these complications. This is when the church needs to step up and say, look, it does work. In fact, it is God's design. And as in the letter to the Ephesians, When Paul says, when Jew and Gentile are reconciled through the cross, that's a demonstration of God's wisdom, not only to the present age, but to the powers of the air, to the spiritual powers. This is the way God shows the power of the gospel and of the cross, to reconcile, to deal with enmity, to create a new humanity, a new way of flourishing as humans made in the image of God in all our diversity and embracing one another practically within that family. Theologically, it's beautiful. Practically, it's really hard work. And that's so often the case. 
But there's the challenge. No, no, there's the invitation. Would you want to be with Peter on the roof saying, no, 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 I don't touch anything pure. No, no, not for me. Or do you want to be Peter in Cornelius' house saying, dude, I never knew you could have so much fun with Gentiles. <laughs> Look at this. This is so awesome. And so much more to know about God. And then, of course, Cornelius is able to say, well, yeah, I mean, this is exactly the God we worship. We know that God is a generous God. That's why of all the gods in the Roman Empire, I, I, I worship the God of Israel. And didn't you know that? And Peter said, well, yes, I did, of course. I, I knew that. I covered that in, um, um, was it God of Israel 101 in my <laughs> preparatory course? Um, but now I'm really getting it. And you're helping me to see the scope of God's care. Um, a couple of final things. God is present and at work in surprising places and people. So the invitation is go into surprising places, meet surprising people. And okay, you may get one or two wrong, but it's worth it for the ones you'll get right. <laughs> and the others will be learning experiences. And mission creates a new community of people who are different in background and culture, but equally accepted by God. We had a neighbor in Auckland who gave up in Christianity a long time ago. Um, you know, he's got very harsh things to say about Christians. They're all hypocrites, about priests. You know, you can't trust them, about Christianity. It's all a fraud. Um, she's a very good friend of ours. She just couldn't understand how we could be Christians and still be nice people. Um, but she's become convinced. In fact, uh, um, she's one of our closest friends. But she moved house because new immigrants moved in next door. Because she said, it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work for different kinds of people to be put in the same street. Um, we shouldn't allow it. That's her attitude. And so, you know, we're far better if everybody just keeps to their own type because we're, we're, we're not made for it. And at the same time, I was involved with the global congregation in Auckland Tabernacle, where you can go any Sunday and worship with people of at least 20 or 30 different um, ethnicities and cultures and languages and see this is something of great beauty. Yes, it works, but it only works in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, any, any thoughts or comments um, questions that you'd like to raise for somebody else to answer? Um, anything you'd like to contribute to the conversation on how God brings people who are seeking him into connection with people whom God is preparing to be his agents of love and truth? Possibly we're going to get some Muslim families living in there I mean, some people in the church, I think, are uncomfortable with that. Others are comfortable with that. Uh, but how far should we go? If they want to set up a mosque as one of the rooms in those houses so they can do worship there, are we comfortable with that? And we can always go down a slippery slope. What if we get some refugees who are practicing, one's a witch doctor, and they want to do some pagan rituals and offer animal sacrifices? Do we go, sure, that's great. We'll accept that and build relationships with you. Or do we say, hang on a minute, this is too far past our culture and get out. So what are you going to do, Chris? <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts. Um, the, this is... There's two things going on there. I mean, one is this is in one way an act of hospitality. And so the question is, to whom are you prepared to be hospitable? Secondly, it is, of course, a commercial transaction. Um, people are renting. I presume you're not letting them stay free. So you're making money out of them. So there's what are their rights as tenants under normal law. And if they want to come and, um, I mean, I went around to do some work on a friend's little rental the other day. Um, and the family that is staying there is, um, is Buddhist. So they have Buddhist shrine in, in the house. And now you're going to say, oh, hang on. Um, we'll, you know, we're happy to take your money to come and stay here, but we don't want you to have that kind of stuff because that's not our religion. I think that uh, my own approach would be um, 
that there are certain things that you might say these are can't be acceptable practices in property that we own. And animal sacrifices would be well up there for me, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> and witchcraft, um, yes. The, the sincere practice of another faith. And um, for me personally, um, you know, isn't that what happens when Christians go to other countries and want to live there as followers of Jesus and share their faith? Um, if they are dependent on only living in a place owned by another Christian, they're pretty limited. Um, so they have to be prepared to go and live in proximity with people of other faiths. And indeed, that's the whole point of them being there. And I would be, I mean, clearly, a key point in this story of Peter is his vision from God that changes the way he thinks, but also the prompting of the Holy Spirit and the specific action. And I... I would say as a general point that gone are the days, if they were ever here, when the church could just follow a list of accepted practices and say we know how to be good Christians. We don't know. We're, we're navigating uncharted waters, and we have to navigate oriented towards the one whom we follow and dependent on the energizing of the Spirit of God and deeply exploring the Scriptures to say, okay, how do we find guidance here? If you're asking me for a personal opinion, I'm quite happy to give that, which is that the thought of people who currently follow other faiths, and for all we know, might be seeking God through other directions, want to come and pretty well live in a church and be saying, well, I wonder if God is bringing them here, and I wonder what of God they will receive from us while they're here in the church in Mangari again, um, they had um, a set of houses, similar, a set of apartments, simple apartments, low cost, um, that uh, were designed to be housing for people that couldn't afford normal, you know, normal rents. And um, the, I mean, it wasn't long, a few years ago, um, when before we were getting Muslim families coming as refugees. So what do you do? I mean, you say, oh, actually, Christians only. And then how good a Christian do you have to be? Um, it was more, do you need somewhere to stay? You do. Well, here's a place. And beautiful relationship grew, particularly with um, um, a Muslim, well, a guy who had become a believer, and then a Muslim family who remained Muslim, but wonderfully open to Christian faith and supportive. And, you know, so I, I say, yeah, I, I mean, I would be saying, in, yes, unless you feel strongly a strong guidance that that particular person isn't. But I would be saying that not just for people of other religions, you know, I'm going for people, nominal Christians, some of them are not folk that are helpful to have living near property. <laughs> yeah, mm, I'll read your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I think the first responsibility uh -huh. of hospitality uh -huh. is to make the other feel comfortable, uh -huh. whether it's through food in your own home or yeah. licking an ice cream as you walk up a beach. Yeah. It's to make the other uh -huh. feel comfortable. Uh -huh. Inviting them on site here, uh -huh. I think we only need to remember that this place was dedicated to the glory of God mm -hmm. and how do we best do that? Yep. That's a good point. The one about make the other feel comfortable, certainly, even if there's some discomfort for us in doing that, definitely. In terms of the house dedicated to the glory of God, um, that makes me think of the temple. And, you know, the temple had the inner court you know, the Holy of Holies, the Court of the Priests, the Court of the Men, the Court of the Women, and then, of course, the Court of the Nations, of the Gentiles. And that's the court that Jesus got busy in. Remember when he cleansed the temple? In the Court of the Gentiles, it had been taken over by the in-group as their commercial enterprise. And so there was no room for the Gentiles who were seeking God to get near. And Jesus cleared them out and he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. But you've made it a den of thieves. 
And uh, so I think we carry that, yes, dedicated to the glory of God. And how is God glorified? God is glorified as the nations are brought to know him. It's possibly the only Anglican here. I'm not referring to Baptist churches when I say this. Um, one of the things that struck me after the 15th was we had this, um, you know, you are us campaign. And I understand the desire to let people know that it's unacceptable and you're a part of a bigger family. But it seems to me the richness that you've been talking about is not about our similarity. It is, and the challenge is actually the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we live with the difference mm -hmm. and honour the difference and learn mm -hmm. from the difference and be transformed mm -hmm. by the difference? So one of the things that happened that we observed pretty quickly was the second day, as I think you guys did too, we had doors open, candles, invited Muslim community to come and pray, etc. And um, up the road, another Anglican parish had a vestry meeting and uh, they were told to watch out for people who looked Muslimish that might come to the door. Hmm. And I was horrified because I thought, hey, well, Jesus looked pretty Muslimish. Um, uh, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're missing the point. Um, but it just struck me as you were teaching that it's actually about the challenge of difference. So we asked our congregation. We only had one service one day. We usually have three. And it was, the question was, as Christians, how do we allow ourselves to be transformed in the face of tragedy? Mm. And what are we prepared to give up about our beliefs of others? Mm -hmm. And then how do we hold each other accountable? Yeah, yeah. And we can't do it all at once. It's one little bit at a time. Um, yeah, so it just struck me that we could go either way with this. We could become really fearful mm -hmm. and do the watch out for the person that comes at the door, mm -hmm. or we can be really open and go, how exciting someone's come to the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Thank you. And, yeah, and I would say, given that nobody, no, no one of us is going to get that 100% right, which side are you going to err on? And I'd rather err on the generous welcome and find them disappointed than err on the side of being overcautious about other people and find that I'm obstructing them and God's work in them and missing out myself.